effect. Uh, <coughs> the session is Geohazards and Disaster Risks in the North Pacific Region. Uh, and really, uh, with a lot of focus on the Russian Far East and Alaska. And we have a, uh, we're privileged to have a keynote talk by my former boss, actually, my former boss's boss, Marsha McNutt. Before uh, Alec introduces her, I just want to give a little background here. Uh, we've uh, had the good fortune to have more and more exchanges with our Russian colleagues, and uh, we keep bumping into uh, problems like uh, moving equipment, you know, customs tariffs, visas. Uh, Americans tend to view this as a Russian problem. Actually, uh, <clears throat> if you're Russian and try to do research in the U.S., you might see a few U.S. problems. These things are reciprocal, and so it's important that we get the governments together at a, uh, in a bilateral dia dialogue to work these things out. And there is a mechanism for this, the Bilateral Presidential Commission, which uh, President Obama and uh, President Medvedev initiated in 2009 and has now been renewed under Putin. And there are 19 working groups, and, uh, but natural hazards was not represented. And we were able to have a meeting in Moscow in July at the Russian Academy of Sciences headquarters with representation by a number of Russian and U.S. Uh, federal agencies uh, with the agreement that there would be a, uh, an actual sub-working group on natural hazards under science and technology, which sub-working group doesn't sound too romantic, but actually I think it'll be a great thing and bodes well for the future. We'll have a town hall Wednesday to just fill you in on this, those who are interested and solicit your ideas about broadening this collaboration in our backyard. Alec, can you introduce Marcia? Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Today, perhaps, uh, some of you uh, attended the lecture, presidential lecture, and the title was uh, Science is Sexy. Uh, I could argue with this uh, speaker, wonderful speaker, that science is a beauty. And uh, telling so, I would like to introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker uh, will give a talk at the special series, which we recently introduced in the Natural Hazard Focus Group. It's a series called it's, uh, Frontiers and Natural Hazards. And the, our first speaker is Dr. Marcia McNaught. She is the director of U.S. Geological Survey and science advisor to U.S. Secretary of the Interior. Marsha McNutt was a president and chief executive officer of the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute and professor at several uh, university, distinguished uh, professor at uh, several universities in uh, USA. At the beginning of her scientific career, uh, in fact, uh, the Marsha did uh, research contributing to disaster risk problems and was a uh, three years work on the earthquake prediction is USGS in Mellow Park, and she's continuing this contribution to the uh, natural hazards by recent, for example, October 12th, the uh, um, exercise or this uh, praxis at the shake out in restaurant. Uh, Dr. Marsha McNutt, she's a fellow of many distinguished societies, and most important, she was a president of AGU, as well as uh, uh, she got uh, two medals of the AGU, one for young scientists, another for distinguished scientists. It's my great pleasure to invite uh, Dr. Marsha McNutt to give the first uh, talk, uh, which is called the Frontiers and Natural Hazard. Thank you so yeah, much. Well Okay, well, thank you very much. I am very pleased to be invited to give this uh, first keynote. And let me just bring it up here, if I can. Oh, I got it. All right. Okay, so um, I'm going to give you an overview on research on geohazards of the North Pacific uh, with um, some of our past accomplishments, our present research, and an eye to the future, particularly 
focusing on some of our collaborations with our Russian colleagues, which are so important because of our shared boundary uh, with Russia. So what will you hear about today? Hmm. Oh, there we go. That worked. Nope. There we go. OK. First of all, <laughs> this is a very dangerous place. Uh, it has great earthquakes, tsunamis, and volcanic eruptions. Uh, I'm going to talk a little about, about the significance of the 1964 earthquake and its contribution to the acceptance of the subduction paradigm. I'll talk about the Alaska pipeline uh, and uh, the effect uh, on heat flow and the 2002 Denali earthquake, about volcanic eruptions and um, the importance of making a Russian connection, and finally about the future. Okay, so here's a map of seismicity, and obviously the Kuril Kamchatka uh, Aleutian and Alaska margin of the Pacific Plate is characterized by rapid subduction and a sharp cusp where the Aleutian arc collides with the Ch Kamchatka Peninsula. And this, of course, uh, spans the uh, Russia US border. Now, um, this region has experienced 16 earthquakes of magnitude eight or greater during the last 100 years, and that includes two of the five magnitude nine events ever recorded. And if we simply rank order the largest, the 30 top earthquakes recorded uh, worldwide, we see that more than half of them have occurred in this one rather small region of the globe, making it one of the most dangerous places uh, in terms of earthquake hazards. For example, um, many of these great or giant earthquakes caused damaging tsunamis. The magnitude nine Kamchatka earthquake of 1952 destroyed the town of Severokurilsk in the northern Kuril Islands. Most of the residents actually self-evacuated before the first wave, but then they returned home and were killed when the second larger wave hit. There was a magnitude 8.6 earthquake um, that uh, actually was lethal thousands of kilometers from its source when a tsunami hit the island of Hilo, Hawaii and caused 159 deaths. In addition to the earthquake and tsunami hazards, um, this area is also characterized by large volcanic eruptions. Um, this uh, plot shows where there are um, VEIs, which is the Volcanic Explosivity Index. And on this index, zero would be a non-explosive eruption and eight would be the largest in history. And this shows all the VEIs greater than four since 1900. And you can see that they cluster at the ends of the subduction zone chain. And if we plot again the rank order of the largest VEIs since 1900, that Katmai on the Alaskan Peninsula, which happened, that eruption happened in 1912, is the Earth's largest eruption since Tambora, which happened in 1805. Katmai is actually the smallest of several caldera forming eruptions that have occurred in the region since the Holocene. So what we're actually seeing here in Alaska um, in this uh, last century is no, by no means the largest that these Alaskan uh, volcanoes can uh, put out in terms of explosive eruptions. Uh, the most intensive uh, volcanism occurs where the Aleutian Arc collides with Kamchatka. And um, the uh, picture here uh, shows um, uh, in 1975 the eruption of Tobachik, uh, which is currently in eruption now. And the cause of this intense eruption is because the is thought to be because of the torn edge of the subducting Pacific plate is exposed to hot mantle uh, under Kamchatka. 
So let me go now to the significance of the 1964 earthquake. This was the well-known Good Friday earthquake and was one of the, uh, well, it was uh, one of the first large earthquakes that was uh, well recorded instrumentally. Um, it occurred under southeast uh, Alaska and is in the category of a mega earthquake. Um, this is the seismic record from Fairbanks, Alaska of that earthquake. Um, you can see on top that the pen was moving so rapidly that there is no record from the initial shock and you don't see actually the recording of the earthquake until the next day when the scale was readjusted um, to actually uh, be within um, the dynamic range of the pen motion. This photograph, for historical reasons, was actually taken by Jack Townsend, a USG, USGS geophysicist who was uh, renowned for his contributions to the USGS uh, uh, observatory program. He was a recipient of DOI's Meritor Meritorious Service Award, and he died this past year after 69 years of public service. Now, this um, earthquake uh, caused, of course, great damage in Anchorage. Um, one spectacular impact was translational sliding of unconsolidated sedimentary deposits. Many houses and buildings were destroyed, and uh, actually much of the city has been rebuilt where that um, damage and liquefaction occurred. In addition, uplift, subsidence with inundation and tsunamis exacted an economic toll along the coast. Of more scientific interest, the focal mechanisms um, from the earthquake permitted either a high angle reverse fault solution or a low angle thrust. And the conventional wisdom of the day favored the formal, the high angle reverse fault. But USGS geologist George Flacker realized that the many islands of Prince William Sound are, um, sat above the rupture zone and contained a rich record of the surface deformation that could potentially distinguish between those two solutions. So uh, George subsequently showed that only the low angle thrust model satisfied the co-seismic uh, deformation and this motion, of course, favored the new global paradigm of plate tectonics. And this was uh, a great turning point in the acceptance of that model. So the 1964 Alaska event was a um, remarkable uh, megathrust earthquake, but it occurred at a pivotal time in the history of Earth science and helped lead to the acceptance of the plate tectonic theory. In addition, the earthquake also um, benefited the science and that it provided deposits from a known event that could be studied to inform efforts to determine the extent and timing of previous events that was critically important information both for understanding the behavior of subduction zones and for assessing seismic hazards from these kind of events worldwide. If we fast forward now to the present, USGS scientists are using modern tools like ShakeMap to understand earthquake events under current conditions um, for the built environment uh, and taking, for example, events like the 1964 um, Good Friday earthquake or a plausible scenario for a 7.2 interplate event uh, near Anchorage and understanding if those events occurred today given that Anchorage has been rebuilt and there's a much higher population today than there was in 1964, what would be the number of deaths? What would be the economic losses if we were to have a repeat of those deaths? And these are very helpful for um, disaster planning and for public education. So um, the, the next uh, topic I want to talk about is um, infrastructure in frontier areas like Alaska. Um, the discovery of oil on Alaska's North Slope um, motivated the building of infrastructure 
um, such as a huge pipeline to carry the oil from the North Slope um, to the ice free port of Valdez. This was the most um, ambitious engineering project of its day. When industry first designed this project, they designed it much like they would design an oil pipeline in the lower 48 uh, with a buried pipeline. But USGS geophysicist Art Lockenbrook realized that burying this pipeline in the permafrost um, would cause the permafrost to melt and lead to catastrophic failure. Um, USGS um, geophysicists also realized that it would cross the major Denali Fault, and that was another risk to the pipeline. So um, their work, along with partners, um, led to a redesign of the pipeline. It increased the cost of the pipeline by an, order, by an order of magnitude, but it was built above ground to avoid melting the uh, permafrost, and it was put on these um, sliders where it crossed the Denali Fault. Um, interestingly enough, um, in 2002, uh, a magnitude um, 8 earthquake struck the Denali Fault, which was the design earthquake uh, for this uh, pipeline. The pipeline slid from one end of the sliders to the other, um, but uh, held together and, um, and did not uh, spill a drop of oil. So sometimes uh, your greatest contributions in a disaster are the ones that uh, don't make a headline. Other challenges in Alaska to infrastructure come from volcanic eruptions. Um, this is a, another uh, oil pipe. This one is on the west side of the upper Cook Inlet that's been threatened twice by volcanic activity um, from um, one in, in 1990 and the other in 2009 where lahars caused by eruption of the Redoubt volcano inundated the Drift River oil terminal and Cape close to overtopping levees that, predicted, that protected oil storage tanks. The Alaskan Volcano Observatory, which is a partnership of USGS and the University of Alaska Fairbanks and the Alaska Division of Geological and Geophysical Surveys, uh, monitor the volcano and were able to warn workers at the facility of impending activity. This was especially important in the second eruption when oil had to be withdrawn down in the tanks and shipped across the inlet to diminish the risk of a large spill. And here you can see these are the storage tanks and these were um, the bunkers that were uh, protecting it. And you can see how the lahars came down and uh, just went right around it, almost overtopping it. A real unpleasant surprise came in 1989 when a passenger 747 aircraft encountered volcanic ash cloud between Anchorage and Fairbanks, which was quite far from the source of the ash um, at Redoubt Volcano. Um, fortunately, the pilot was able to restart the two engines, but it was less than a minute before it would have crashed. The plane and passengers arrived safely in Anchorage, but it was a clear demonstration that even remote volcanoes need to be uh, monitored for aircraft safety. So one consequence of this near miss was rapid expansion of the monitoring networks of the newly and fortuitously established Alaska Volcano Observatory. And these show um, the, uh, the networks in red are the real-time uh, networks of the uh, station and um, in black, um, where there's uh, no seismic network on the volcanoes. Um, in addition to um, having the monitoring, we needed to have a simple way to um, alert the uh, pilots and the FAA to uh, what the status was. And uh, so the USGS worked with the aviation industry, the FAA, and the International Civil Aviation Administration to develop educational materials and this um, simple color coding, um, which is now widely used, um, green, yellow, orange, and red, um, to determine the status of a volcano and its uh, threat to aviation. But monitoring U.S. volcanoes was not enough. Much of the ash that was entering, oops, I think I went the wrong way. 
Uh, much of the ash entering the busy international air routes between Eastern Asia and North America was actually coming from volcanoes in Kamchatka. For two decades now, scientists from the Russian Academy of Sciences, uh, Kamchatka Geophysical Service, and AVO have coordinated monitoring and warnings for some 100 potentially dangerous volcanoes of the Kuriles, Kamchatka, Aleutians, and the Alaskan mainland. As a result, there has not been a single serious encounter with ash by aircraft since the incident that I just described in 1989. This is an exceptional example of international cooperation in natural disaster risk mitigation, and the more so because the two countries involved were at odds with each other almost up until the time that the cooperation began. And here's an example of how modeling is being used to help understand exactly what the impact of ash clouds can be. Um, because forecasting is really important in, uh, in these remote areas in understanding how to uh, route uh, jet aircraft that are uh, crossing the Pacific uh, where they usually take um, polar routes. And uh, you can see that uh, you can uh, use uh, the equations for, um, uh, for uh, transport. Oops, sorry. Oh, why is this not playing? Well, well, I guess it doesn't want to play. Well, it, well, here, here we go. Here we go. This is a nice simulation from uh, Larry Mastin at the Cascades Volcano Observatory showing um, a simulation of how ejecti from a volcano, um, and actually it compares um, the uh, observed, compares the model with actual observed um, from uh, satellites of the ejecti from um, an erupting volcano. And in this case, it was from Kasatachi, which erupted in 2008. Okay, so looking to the future. Um, obviously, operational 3D ash cloud modeling uh, with fallout uh, is important. Get to the future here. Oh, well, all right. And running earthquake, tsunami, and ash scenarios to understand potential impacts to society and the built environment of extreme events. USGS uh, plans to take advantage of the 50th anniversary of the Great Alaska Earthquake as a time for remembering, a time for learning, and a time for teaching. Also, uh, we're developing the big picture and improved monitoring and preparedness with our Russian neighbors. This past year, we worked with Russian colleagues in the Ministry of Education and Science the Russian Academy of Sciences, uh, EMRCOM and Ross Hydromet and our U.S. agency partners of NOAA, FEMA, NASA, and NSF to establish a bilateral committee on natural hazards. This is formally termed a subworking group, and uh, we already heard about that from um, John, and exists under the Working Group for Science and Technology of the Bilateral Presidential uh, Commission. Here are some uh, objectives of this, oops, there we go. Some objectives of this um, binational cooperation. To expand sharing of real-time geophysical data. Uh, of course, we've worked with many nations in terms of data sharing, but it is extremely important in the natural hazards arena to share uh, real-time data because with, uh, when it, whether it's uh, tsunamis, earthquakes, or volcanic eruptions, it's very important to get real-time geophysical data. To share experiences and identify best practices in hazard assessment and risk mitigation. To develop a strategy to adequately monitor all of the northernmost Pacific Ocean and adjacent Bering Sea region. This is an extremely large region with a low population, and therefore it stretches the resources of both nations to adequately cover uh, the region 
um, simply uh, changing the batteries in seismometers can be um, a major um, undertaking in order to get there and uh, pay for uh, simply the uh, aircraft or helicopter time to do it. And um, finally, to uh, encourage bilateral research in geodynamics and disaster risk reduction. Finally, um, USGS looks forward to increased international cooperation in disaster risk reduction. In today's interconnected world, disasters have international impact, and learning to prevent natural hazards from causing disasters is international. We can't prevent natural hazards, but we can do our best uh, to prevent them from becoming disasters. Um, we can ask the question what we can learn from recent events in Japan, uh, New Zealand, and Chile and provide those lessons um, elsewhere uh, in order to um, reduce uh, the risk to populations that live um, in hazardous areas. And we also need to overcome barriers to monitor the most dangerous parts of the earth across borders together and to respond to emergencies across borders together. Indeed, one of the lessons of recent years is that large natural disasters are international in scope and the science to mitigate them must be international as well. So we at the USGS look forward to a bright future of collaboration with our neighbor Russia and, to other, and with other international partners. So thank you very much and I'm happy to take questions. have a time for questions. Uh, I have a question. Uh, oh, oh, yes. Yes, please. Yes. Uh, okay. What it considers best practice in seismic hazard assessment. Um, Okay, where to start on that? <laughs> uh, okay, uh, that's, that's a very, very big topic. Um, well, of course, it starts with um, the geologic record and um, to extend instrumental recording because um, the more we understand about the Well, okay, let me, let me start even back before that. We have to, first of all, we have to understand where the faults are. We have to understand from the geologic record and instrumental recording um, and from things like, uh, if I, even looking at the East Coast earthquake where we can't even find the faults, Sometimes we don't even have the benefit of knowing where the faults are, and so we have to use something like the East Coast earthquake um, to divine from landslides that happened what we can use as a proxy for uh, learning about what in the rock record to look for as uh, might be an evidence of prior earthquake activity. So depending on where we are on the planet, we have to use every tool in the toolbox to learn something about what might be uh, a more complete record for um, uh, earthquakes. So first of all, um, we start with trying to find out where the faults are and then getting as complete a record of um, the history of seismicity. Then um, we have to uh, learn something about what the um, uh, what ground shaking will be. So um, again, comparing East Coast to West Coast, uh, the same magnitude earthquake in uh, different parts of the um, country or different parts of the world will not have the same kind of ground shaking. So that makes for very different um, kinds of hazards um, in uh, different areas. And then, of course, um, when you have hazards intersecting with people in the built environment, that involves different risks as well. 
So there are many, many parts of this. Thank you very much. Yeah, short question, please. <laughs> yeah. yeah, shorter question than that, please. <laughs> yes. Yes, yes. Yes. Well, um, you know, I, I think it, it probably, um, all I can say is, um, let, let me just say what we try to do at the USGS. What we try to do at the USGS is, even if someone's made um, a prediction um, for an earthquake that we may not think um, is necessarily science-based. Let's say someone says, I had a dream last night that there was going to be an earthquake. Um, at the USGS, we would, and, and someone says, what do you think of that prediction? What we would do at the USGS is say, anyone who lives in earthquake country needs to understand that they are always at risk for earthquakes. Someone has predicted an earthquake, and um, everyone needs to wake up every day saying to themselves, there could be an earthquake today, tomorrow, um, next week, next year. And um, have I prepared myself, my family, um, my community, my uh, company, anything that they have some kind of of um, control over in the best way possible to lower their risk from an earthquake. Um, is, my, is my environment safe from falling things? Do I have an earthquake um, emergency kit handy? Does my family know what to do in the case of um, an, uh, an earthquake, where to meet? how to respond. I think the important thing is we should never minimize the risk of um, living in an earthquake area and never communicate that we are minimizing that risk. And that's all I'll say about that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And very brief question it's, uh, from my side because yes, it's, yes. I told, it's yes. a question related you, you to are, is it you possible? You are the session chair. You, can, you have the uh, <laughs> uh, Could USGS, together with the Russian uh, agencies, consider a possibility to establish a program where the young scientists can cooperate? I mean, it's, uh, to, to come together and to establish. I mean, it's uh, not necessary to tell yes now because it's uh, something to be negotiated, but is it possible in general to establish such a program for the early career scientists mm. to cooperate? Well, um, you know, I think that's a very interesting proposal and one we should discuss more. Uh, we at the USGS are really eager to um, increase the opportunities for our young scientists and I think that um, something like this um, might be, uh, you know, if it's something that they're interested in doing and we see that this is something that can be a career advancement opportunity for them. Um, I know that when I was a young scientist, I very much benefited from international experiences in Russia, <laughs> particularly. And so um, I, I think that this is something worth discussing. Yes. Thank you very much for your presentation and thank you. <laughs> Our next speaker uh, is uh, Pavel Izbekov, and he will be uh, talking about the Alaska Russian Far East connection in volcano research and monitoring. Pavel, the floor is yours. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, okay, good afternoon. Uh, it's my uh, pleasure and honor to be here. Uh, I guess I was uh, invited primarily as a tool uh, to present uh, uh, some uh, of our activities uh, focused on improvement of uh, volcano research and monitoring in um, uh, Northern Pacifica. Of course, uh, this uh, uh, activity involves a lot of uh, people, uh, and uh, I'm uh, merely just uh, one of them. So uh, today, um, where is the forward button? That one doesn't. Okay. All right. Ah, okay. All right, I'll push the button. So today, uh, what I'll try to do, I'll, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, can't resist uh, an opportunity to emphasize once again what's going on in terms of volcanic eruptions in uh, Northern Pacifica. Uh, I'll then uh, uh, re-emphasize uh, one more time the same point uh, as uh, Marshall just uh, did, that uh, international collaboration is uh, absolutely crucial uh, for volcanic hazard mitigation in this particular area. Uh, I will uh, try to outline uh, some of our efforts uh, which uh, uh, help us to improve uh, volcanic research uh, and uh, monitoring. And uh, uh, then I will uh, uh, perhaps uh, try to make a point that uh, uh, we are doing a good job, after which I'll uh, tell you that uh, perhaps it's not enough and there is always a room for improvement. So uh, Alaska. Uh, Russian Far East uh, connection. Of course, uh, this is uh, an area map which shows the current ongoing uh, volcanic uh, uh, activities. Uh, three volcanoes uh, at uh, color code uh, yellow, which uh, means that uh, there is uh, some uh, activity above the ground level. Uh, eight volcanoes uh, in uh, Kamchatka and northern uh, Kurals, one volcano in Kurals. Uh, those volcanoes which are orange means that they are in the state of uh, ongoing eruption. And I would like to show you a couple of examples. Shevelich volcano, it was uh, uh, northernmost uh, in Kamchatka. Nice uh, uh, dome growing inside uh, the 1964 crater, which uh, uh, periodically collapses and uh, produces explosive eruptions, sending uh, volcanic ash clouds up to the elevation of uh, 10, 12 kilometers. Uh, this is uh, one of the uh, many examples uh, from uh, last uh, spring, summer. Uh, I, I was uh, trying to uh, populate my database, but then I left for field work in Kamchatka. So it, this activity actually continues. Uh, you can see uh, the ash cloud going to the east. We are looking from the uh, south to Shevelich. Uh, this is the Kamchatka River. And this cloud uh, is at appro approximately uh, eight kilometers. It's uh, going to the east toward Alaska. And uh, this is uh, a signature in satellite imagery of the same uh, uh, Volcanic cloud in the image splitter. It's a software, a software uh, made by uh, AVO uh, G Geophysical Institute. Um, neighbor of Shevelich, uh, slightly to the south, Bizimiana Volcano, which uh, was a focus of our uh, five year NSF funded project. I'll uh, briefly uh, talk about it uh, later. Shevelich, uh, uh, Talbachik Volcano, I'll again mention it uh, uh, in a few minutes. Um, Bismarck volcano erupts um, regularly, almost uh, uh, on a uh, schedule, uh, twice a year. And it uh, produces uh, uh, nice volcanic ash clouds, which uh, also uh, go uh, frequently to the uh, east. Uh, we are looking uh, from Klutschi uh, settlement. There is a, a nice gigantic uh, volcano Klutschevskoy. Uh, Bismarck is uh, hidden beneath, uh, behind it. So this cloud goes uh, to the east again. And this happens uh, twice a year. In fact, the frequency of these eruptions allowed our Russian colleagues to uh, calibrate the height of the eruptive cloud uh, uh, relative to the uh, level of seismicity. Uh, another uh, uh, volcano in the same Kluchevskoy group of volcanoes, uh, 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 Talbachik volcano. This is Ostrip Talbachik, this is uh, Plosky Talbachik. And uh, this is uh, what is going uh, at Talbachik uh, right now. Uh, eruption started last uh, week, uh, and uh, um, uh, we have uh, eruption probably of uh, high aluminum basalt uh, uh, coming uh, from a series of cracks on the southern flank of uh, Talbachik volcano. Uh, in one day, uh, this eruption produced a, a lava flow which exceeds in length eight kilometers. 
And uh, in satellite imagery, this is, uh, uh, you can see it as a big bright spot. This is a, a thermal infrared imagery, a VHR imagery. Again, you are looking at uh, uh, image uh, flipper from uh, AVO GI. Of course, it would be uh, unfair uh, to ignore Karimsky volcano, which uh, erupts regularly on a daily, weekly basis, and it sends uh, volcanic ash clouds to the elevation of uh, seven, seven uh, ten kilometers sometimes. So this happens uh, right now. So why it is uh, important? Uh, volcanic ash. Volcanic ash is a primary major uh, is primary and major uh, concern for aviation because uh, when uh, it gets to the engines of uh, uh, modern aircrafts. Uh, these uh, particles uh, uh, melt, they accumulate, they cause uh, uh, the failure of all four engines at the same time, which is uh, uh, quite uh, unfortunate. And uh, this is a, a map of air routes from Asia to the uh, Northern America. All of them are uh, going uh, downwind from uh, Kamchatka, and uh, because of the polar vortex, uh, the wind direction usually here, as you just saw, from uh, west to east. So the ash actually goes uh, across this uh, uh, air routes and uh, to Alaska. So uh, uh, this was uh, just to uh, emphasize one more time that uh, active volcanoes in the northern Pacific region are uh, distributed across political boundaries. They are uh, both in Russia and the United States uh, and other countries. Uh, Volcanic ash travels with no respect to political boundaries. And this is exactly why the international cooperation is uh, crucial in volcano monitoring. So uh, we uh, use uh, uh, multiple uh, ways uh, to improve our volcano monitoring. And uh, this includes uh, uh, improving direct links uh, between volcano uh, monitoring agencies. Uh, this includes uh, AVO, KVERT, SVERT. I'll uh, briefly touch it. Uh, this includes uh, uh, facilitating uh, uh, research uh, uh, to improve our understanding of subduction processes. And this includes uh, our uh, regular meetings, uh, JCASP meetings, for example, and uh, uh, scientific projects. Uh, this also includes our educational activity, uh, which uh, is, for example, our uh, International Volcanological Field School, which uh, is offered as a four-credit class uh, on both sides of the uh, border uh, in Alaska and in Kamchatka. So in terms of uh, volcano observatories, there is uh, a lot of activities going on. Uh, frequent uh, visits uh, of personnel, uh, 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 exchange of uh, data. Uh, most uh, importantly, we uh, receive uh, daily and weekly updates about ongoing activity in Kamchatka, and we share the same information with our Russian colleagues. So this is just an example of a typical update from uh, KVERT, Kamchatka Volcanic Eruption Response Team, and this is uh, a couple of days ago. And you can see how many volcanoes are listed at orange, yellow, and what kind of activity is going on. This is a normal, regular routine data exchange. And uh, uh, KVERT was established uh, with help of AVR in 1993. So this uh, coming year, uh, there will be a 20th anniversary, uh, another opportunity to celebrate, uh, 20th anniversary of uh, KVERT activity. Uh, similarly, uh, AVO uh, helped to establish an, uh, a partner agency in Sakhalin, uh, which is responsible for volcano monitoring in uh, Kurals, particularly in southern Kurals and central Kurals. This is a daily update. Right now, there is uh, one volcano showing uh, signs of activity. There is uh, an uh, effusive eruption going on at uh, a snow volcano. There is also a fresh thermal anomaly reported today at uh, Birita Ruba volcano. In terms of uh, 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 scientific uh, uh, aspects, uh, uh, first and foremost, I would like to uh, mention our series of uh, meetings uh, known as uh, Japan Kamchatka Aleutian uh, Alaska Subduction Processes. Uh, this is uh, uh, used to be a small workshop uh, originated in 1994. Now it's uh, full blown. Uh, international uh, scientific meeting, which uh, uh, we cycle. Uh, uh, between uh, Kamchatka, United States, Alaska, and Japan, our uh, major uh, partner in, uh, uh, in Asia, uh, which uh, uh, involvement is very important because uh, volcanoes actually go all the way uh, uh, down south there. 
uh, in terms of uh, projects, uh, according to Evgeny Gordiev, uh, as far as I remember, last summer there were uh, more than 20 research groups uh, working in Kamchatka uh, uh, from uh, early spring uh, to uh, late fall, and most of these groups were international. One of the examples of such activity uh, is our uh, PIRA uh, project, which was uh, funded by NSF, focusing on uh, comparison of uh, 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 volcanoes with uh, uh, partial uh, edifice collapse followed by uh, volcanic eruptions in the Russian uh, uh, side, uh, which is uh, uh, Bizimiani and Shevelich, uh, with uh, Mount St. Helens, which is in the United States. We used uh, Russian volcanoes, Russian twins, as proxies, trying to understand what future perhaps uh, awaits Mount St. Helens. So this was a, a five-year uh, project, uh, which was a partnership be between the University of Alaska Fairbanks, uh, Institute of Volcanology and Seismology, uh, KBGS, Kamchatka branch of uh, Geophysical Survey, uh, Russian Academy of Science, as well as uh, Kamchatka State University. So on the U.S. side, it was funded uh, uh, through NSF. We've got uh, 2.3 million uh, through PIRE program, which was uh, uh, quite uh, generous, and we really appreciate this. Uh, it was also uh, supported uh, uh, considerably uh, on the Russian side uh, through uh, uh, various uh, ways of uh, uh, support, uh, including the personal support, including transportation, and so on and so forth. We had more than 60 people involved into the uh, project, and uh, by now uh, our uh, uh, activity uh, helped uh, more than um, uh, 14 people to defend their dissertations. Most of them are PhD dissertations. And we have uh, more than 30 papers published in peer-reviewed uh, 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 journals. So this is merely uh, one of the examples. There are more uh, projects going on which uh, involve uh, both US and Russian uh, scientists uh, uh, working together in uh, Kamchatka. Uh, on educational side, uh, we have uh, uh, International Volcanological Field School, uh, which uh, uh, is uh, uh, a field camp offered uh, on both sides of the border. Uh, one is uh, in Katmai, uh, which is in Alaska, and this is a group uh, uh, going to the Valley of 10,000 Smokes uh, last, uh, uh, last June. And, uh, on the opposite side, we uh, take students to Mutnovsky and Gariela Volcano and sometimes uh, Talbachik. This happens in August. Uh, well, uh, I would say uh, yes, we uh, uh, have already uh, uh, done a good job in uh, some of the aspects. However, there is still plenty of uh, volcanoes which are not monitored uh, and uh, posing a fundamental uh, uh, um, danger uh, uh, to aviation and uh, local communities. Uh, two examples are uh, Kasatochi volcano in 2008, it was uh, just mentioned, uh, erupted uh, uh, unexpectedly, explosively, and uh, with uh, little warning. Uh, similarly, uh, Sarachev Peak in Kurals, uh, it did the same in 2009. So uh, this uh, simply uh, suggests to me that uh, perhaps uh, there is uh, uh, a lot of potential uh, still uh, to uh, expand our efforts and work together to uh, improve safety in this particular region. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pavel. Oh, we have a question, time for a few questions. Question. No. Uh, what question regarding your, uh, particularly, uh, you mentioned that there, there were program, uh, I mean, it's uh, one of two programs which is related to the cooperation with the uh, Russians. Uh, this PIRE, PIRE or mm -hmm. something, mm -hmm. is it still continuing or is it already uh, finished, program terminated? Uh, uh, we started this project in uh, 2005 with uh, John Ankeberger, uh, Jeff Ramir, Mike West. Uh, the uh, project was extended uh, for six years, but uh, last spring I have submitted the final report. Uh, at the same time, uh, the collaboration didn't uh, finish, uh, it didn't end it, uh, with this particular project. We invested a lot of efforts uh, to install a dense uh, network of seismic uh, instruments at Bizimiano Volcano. We installed uh, permanent uh, uh, GPS stations. Uh, we do keep uh, access to all these uh, uh, networks and uh, the data is still coming. There is uh, uh, a lot of samples and a lot of people are still working uh, on uh, this uh, data. So the project is continuing. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Next speaker is uh, uh, Grapertin. 
correct. <laughs> and uh, Fry Muller, the uh, talk was dedicated to the volcanic plumes. And please, yeah, uh, your floor. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, I'm actually uh, one of those that benefited hugely from the uh, from the Pyre project and um, uh, I, uh, the the international school that Kabo just talked about. <laughs> All right, thanks. I guess that's better. Um, but today I'll be uh, mainly talking about uh, another part of my uh, dissertation that I recently finished, uh, looking into volcanic plumes monitored with uh, GPS. And uh, before um, talking about how, how that is done, I, I reiterate a little bit about uh, over what uh, has been mentioned by Pavel, um, that uh, we have volcanoes here in Alaska and the Aleutians and in Kamchatka, the Kurals and Japan. And uh, those black lines here show the um, very common flight routes taken by commercial airliners. Um, those volcanoes can put out plumes that uh, contain ash when the, this is ingested by um, jet engines. Uh, those can clog, and if, if all the engines clog, we have uh, an airplane in, in free fall, which, uh, which have happened several times uh, already and also was the reason for um, the uh, 2010 AFH Jericho uh, airspace closures in, in Europe. Um, there are already uh, pretty big efforts being done. Pavel showed um, some, uh, some very nice images uh, with, with remote sensing. Um, and the, the issue there is, however, that uh, although there's really nice spatial coverage, uh, there are some, uh, some issues with, with uh, temporal resolution. We can see here that uh, some of the um, geostationary satellites uh, have uh, roughly 25 minute repeat time. Uh, some are a little faster uh, to take an image at, uh, at spatial resolution that is fairly low. Uh, those plumes can be detected. What I'm, what I'm talking about here is that there are windows where plumes might be ejected uh, that could maybe not be catched in real time with, uh, uh, with any of these sensors. What I want to emphasize, though, is that uh, what I'll talk about here is uh, trying to assist and not replacing any of the remote sensing efforts. Uh, this is really a complementary technique that, uh, that I'm talking about. So how can GPS help? Uh, well, there's a space segment here. We have satellites. Uh, those send out uh, signals that re um, are received by an antenna, um, recorded on a receiver, and then in GPS processing, uh, this is converted into, into a position. Uh, during that processing, we have to estimate um, a model for the, uh, or apply a model for the, for the troposphere, which uh, as soon as a volcano puts out a plume is changed for those signals that actually uh, pierce this plume. Uh, what the plume does, it introduces a phase delay, which uh, basically means that the signal takes longer to arrive at the station. Uh, in, in processing results in GPS products, this means that um, over the course of a day, which is the time series I'm showing here, just in the vertical component, uh, after the onset of an, of an uh, eruption, uh, we get uh, artificial offsets in our time series that uh, are really just due to a change in the, uh, in the medium uh, that uh, the signal travels through. It is 
relatively unclear which of uh, the plume components uh, co causes that. Uh, there is uh, water vapor, there are sol solid particles, gases, uh, a range of temperatures and, and pressure changes involved. <clears throat> uh, water vapor is already a good candidate because in, uh, in GPS processing, uh, we, we, have to, we, have to, we have to consider this, and actually there are real-time applications for real-time um, meteorology, meteorology that, um, that make use of the effects that uh, water vapor has on, on the GPS signal. Solid particles are also a really good candidate, uh, considering how short-lived this artificial offset here is. This is about 40 minutes. And this, uh, this time um, correlates very nicely with uh, the actual duration of ash output uh, of, of the volcano here. This was in, at, at readout in 2009. These observations have been made before uh, at Miyakejima in 2000, or for the 2000 eruption, and at Mount St. Helens in 2005 uh, by Hulier and others. Uh, more recently by uh, Aranzola, for, for Aetna, uh, they provide uh, statistical evidence that even smaller plumes at Aetna um, affect the, the GPS positions. However, this is not yet exploited in, uh, in routine monitoring, and this is mainly due to the lack of real-time GPS, which, um, if you recall, the remoteness of most of the volcanoes in, uh, in Alaska and um, the North Pacific in general, is uh, easy to understand. GPS is, is very data, data intensive, so uh, our hope is that in the future, with hardening of um, telemetry links, um, many more of the already recording or existing stations on volcanoes can be turned over into real time. And um, at this point, we should make use of all the tools or all the applications that we can use GPS for. Okay, so to, to convince you a little bit more uh, that this actually works, I will go through uh, two eruptions. The first one is the 2009 Redoubt eruption that was already mentioned before. Redoubt is to the uh, southwest of Anchorage, about 160 kilometers here, marked with the red triangle. During that eruption, we had uh, four temporary continuous stations that were recording and a plate boundary observatory station that was there since uh, 2006 and uh, recording continually, continuously. Uh, all these data are collected at a uh, 30-second sample rate. Uh, the eruption had an uh, explosive phase from March 23rd through April 4th, um, 2009, with 19 explosions and plumes up to uh, 18 kilometers. Um, in in the next few slides, I will focus on AC-17 and RVBM, which is the station just to the east of the volcano here in the near field. Um, this, is, this is one of the kinematic time series, part of which I already showed earlier, for the uh, day April 4th in 2009, uh, showing the entire day of uh, GPS positions in the up east and north component. And again, we can see in all three components, uh, a very large spike during the time of, of the eruption, and then everything goes back to normal afterwards. If we zoom out and look at the actual uh, entire explosive period for that, for that eruption, uh, we, we can see that this is a very consistent pattern showing up for many of the explosive events, and not so much for some of the smaller ones that we can see here. Uh, this is also something uh, that shows up nicely in the uh, phase residuals that are plotted down here, and you can see those uh, faint blue spikes. Um, and uh, so if we, go, if we go ahead and plot these phase residuals along the satellite sky tracks, so you can imagine this, this being the location of the station, and you look up in the sky and you, you plot just where the, um, where the satellite traverses the, the sky, and along this we plot the phase residuals, which are a product of uh, subtracting the actual recordings from the satellite um, from, the, uh, from the models that come out of the GPS processing software. Um, in faint gray, we can't see much of phase residuals here after and before the eruption. In uh, red, we can see the time 
during which the volcano was actually putting out ash or a plume. Um, we can see that uh, the, the increase in, in phase residuals in MISFIT uh, increases significantly um, during that time for many of the satellites, but uh, there's a high uh, directional component to this. If we look at the base station, uh, again, we can see, uh, which is to the uh, northeast of the volcano, we can see a little blip here um, in the southeasterly sky for this satellite. Uh, but not much uh, for the other satellites. There's, uh, there's some little blip that comes here uh, at Pier N10, which really is just an artifact of the, of the network-based processing that was, uh, that was done here using a least squares approach. The errors are uh, distributed over a range of parameters. Uh, this plot shows the footprint of the plume, just confirming what I what I tried to derive from, uh, derive from, the, uh, from the satellite um, sky plots here, that the plume is in fact to the, uh, to the east of RVBM, and um, if the satellite was in the southeasterly sky from AC-17, we, uh, we can explain uh, this little artifact here. Now, uh, what I'm really interested in and working towards right now is uh, actually deriving plume properties. Uh, I mentioned that there are many uh, parameters that uh, are to be estimated during GPS processing. Uh, and <clears throat> to, uh, those are somewhat um, areas where the processing could hide some of the misfit that we would like to see here. Uh, we can reduce uh, those, those parameters by fixing the position and, um, and not estimating a wet uh, troposphere. This significantly reduces the, the number of parameters. And if we go back and forth here, uh, we can see that, um, of course, uh, outside of the active plume phase, uh, the residuals increase, but they increase significantly here. And this now contains this little spike that I showed in the time series before. Um, making it ultimately more possible to use the phase residuals to estimate uh, atmospheric refractivity, which we then would like to use to, um, to get at parameters such as density of a plume. Um, the other example is Akhmat Volcano, which is a little further out in the Aleutians here. Uh, during that eruption in 2008, two stations were uh, recording GPS data, and if we zoom in on OKFG, which we have here, okay. I wasn't going to show an animation in here. Okay, there we go. Um, so, okay, so if we, if we look at this station and the phase residuals here, which we see in, uh, in light gray, um, there's not much happening during a day of no eruption um, all over the sky. Uh, but as soon as the eruption sets on, which is plotted in green, uh, we can see the phase residuals increase all over the sky because the site is fairly close to, uh, fairly close to the vent. Uh, and again, there's the directional component that, I, that we already saw, saw at, uh, at readout. Okay, so to summarize this here really quickly, at readout we saw 17 plumes above 12 kilometers. We could detect 12 of those, and there weren't any false positives. Uh, for the Elkmog eruption, we could, uh, could have detected the, uh, the onset in real time using just this one station. And, um, a more detailed analysis was prevented due to telemetry and data loss issues. Uh, the GPS-based plume protect, uh, detection really is a byproduct of the processing. Uh, the azimuths can be re uh, readily inferred. And again, I want to emphasize that this is complementary to remote sensing efforts uh, to, to bridge those gaps that happen uh, when no satellite is making an observation. We want to keep this in mind for future network designs and uh, test the, 
So in the future, we test real-time capability, detection limits, and uh, want to do further work on plume characteristics. Thank you. Thanks, Ronnie. Uh, I think we better move on. Uh, that, that was rather novel. I guess GPS can do anything. <coughs> Next talk is uh, Gavin Hayes uh, from USGS in Golden, Colorado. Uh, USGS National Earthquake Information Center Earthquake Monitoring Response and Research in the Northern Pacific Region. All right, thanks everyone for leaving um, and, and everyone that, that, that stuck around. Um, so, so my name's Gavin Hayes um, from the US Geological Survey National Earthquake Information Center. Um, I'm gonna be talking to you today about our, our monitoring capabilities in, in, the, um, in, in the Northern Pacific region um, with a particular focus on, on, on what I think we can do for um, speeds of, of accurate magnitude estimates. Um, for, for large subduction zone earthquakes in this region. So, uh, just by way of reintroduction to, uh, to earthquakes in the region, these concat concatenated maps um, show the, um, the history of large uh, subduction zone earthquakes over the 20th and, and early 21st century in uh, the Alaska Aleutians Arc and, and Kuril Kamchatka Arcs. And, and as you can see, that, that history is pretty rich. The, the, there's been almost complete rupture of, the, of both subduction zones um, a, a, over that time period. And, and so what, what, what I'm going to focus on over, over the next series of slides is, given the reoccurrence of one of these earthquakes or the occurrence of a, a similar event in these regions, how quickly could we derive a, a, an accurate magnitude for, for, for these uh, sized earthquakes? Uh, first of all, why am I talking about this? Um, the, national, the USGS National Earthquake Information Center is, is, the, is the institution, for those of you that don't know us, that is, that is mandated by the US government to respond to uh, both international and, and domestic uh, earthquakes. We, we do this on a, on a 24 by 7 basis. Um, our goals are to respond to significant global events within uh, about 20 minutes and, and to domestic events in perhaps less than 10 minutes. Um, the, these are the, the three major missions of, of the NEIC. Um, what I'll focus on mostly is this monitoring mission, um, but what I'd really like to emphasize is that uh, to do this monitoring mission properly and, and quickly and accurately, we, we, uh, this, this second mission, uh, both the integration of the data and, and the maintenance of, of, of the seismic stations that record that data is a, is a, is a really key issue. Um, a lot of people say to improve um, recording of earthquakes, we need more seismic stations. While that's true, we also need the data that's coming out of those seismic stations to be good. Um, and, and, and so monitoring the stations that exist um, is really important. And then I'll finish the talk um, by, by discussing some of our research pursuits in the region, um, because obviously improving our understanding of these systems uh, impacts our, our monitoring capabilities as well. Um, so, so for me, what are some of the keys uh, uh, to, to rapid earthquake responses? First of all, as I said, data availability. Um, we need uh, evenly spaced global data for uh, accuracy and uniformity of our, of our um, earthquake catalogs. And we need uh, dense regional networks for improving the, the speed of the, uh, those responses to the earthquakes and the magnitude of completeness of those catalogs. But as well as actually having the data, we need the data to be, to be usable, to be good. Uh, we need those data to have low signal to noise ratios so we can uh, focus on the signal that the earthquakes are generating. And we need the electronics at the stations, the metadata of the stations uh, to be accurate so we can process the earthquakes that they record. This is just an extreme example of, of, of two uh, global stations that recorded the uh, 2012 uh, Sumatra earthquake in, in, in April, one showing obviously a, a, a very clean earthquake record and, and one not, not giving us much at all. Um, ideally, it, it's good to have long period seismic data um, uh, for, for particularly the, the, the very big earthquakes. The energy of the earthquake is carried at long periods. And so to constrain the size of those events accurately, we need long period seismic data. 
And, and finally, we need good source inversion techniques. Um, it, it's not a lot of use having, having great data and, and great long period data if we don't have uh, good, good, good methods to use that data and invert it for earthquake size. For uh, the past several years at the NEIC, we've been using uh, the W phase source inversion that's been developed by Hiro Kanamori, Luis Rivera, uh, Zachary Dupatel, and, and others um, to, to really take advantage of, of what is a, 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 a rapidly um, a, expanding phase uh, arriving in, in, in the body wave train. Um, so it, it's fast, uh, uh, it arrives at seismic stations quickly, we can invert for uh, the source characteristics of, a, of an earthquake quickly. And it's very stable because it propagates in the upper mantle. And so um, we find that when inverting these earthquakes at both teleseismic and regional distances, our estimates don't vary over time and so um, stabilize very quickly. Um, what I'll be showing you over the next sequence of slides then is, is, is how we're using the W phase to respond to these earthquakes. And, and, and based on our, our real-time capabilities, our real-time uh, data availability, what um, the, the times would be to, to constrain magnitudes of earthquakes using this inversion technique. So zooming in on the, um, on the, on the Northern Pacific, Alaska, uh, Kamchatka in, in, in Japan, um, the, the black triangles in this figure are the real-time broadband data that, 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 that we have available at the NEIC. The, the colors in this um, map represent the time to uh, uh, what I think are ideal times to uh, rapid uh, accurate magnitudes in the Northern Pacific. So this is based on um, one, the, the, those real-time stations that are available to us, uh, two, uh, the number of stations that, that we need to accurately invert for the size of an earthquake using this uh, W phase technique, um, and, uh, and, 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 and some um, analysis of how quickly uh, that, that move out occurs and how quickly we can invert for the for, for this, um, uh, source characteristics. So you can see in, in the, uh, the western US in Alaska, um, constraints of accurate magnitude are possible very quickly, perhaps within five minutes. And as um, station density decrease moving onto the, uh, onto the other side of the Pacific, those times uh, increase. But, but this is assuming uh, perfect uh, uh, data and, and, and perfect usage of that data. Um, basically assuming that we can use all data that we collect at all those stations. And we know, as I just mentioned, that that's not true. So if we think about some um, global statistics of, of, of how many data we can use versus how many data are actually available, um, and, and, and just use some, some average global statistics um, for, for that parameter, then we can modify our, our response maps um, like this. And we see um, uh, increased times in, in, in much of this uh, Pacific Rim region, but still uh, pretty, pretty quick times in, in, in this region of, of, of the uh, Northwest US and Alaska. As I said, this is based on average global statistics. Um, but we know also that, that all stations, all seismic stations aren't created equally. Some are better than others. Um, some have better signal to noise ratios than others. And so what we can do next is, is look at the individual statistics for all of these stations and, and, and see how that affects our response times to earthquakes in these particular regions. So what I'm showing over this next sequence of slides is based on W phase inversions for all historic earthquakes, and this is all um, earthquakes over the 20th century, um, this particular slide at, at, the, at the magnitude uh, six level. Um, this, this, this slide shows um, at each of those stations, at each component of those stations, the vertical component and the two horizontal components, um, how many times the data, the, the ratio of how many times the data were actually used at that station for a W phase inversion versus how many times the data were actually available at that station. And you can see that for much of this region, for this group of earthquakes, um, the, the, the ratios are actually pretty low. Um, they're fairly high on some uh, vertical components, particularly in Alaska and the western US. But in general, at this magnitude threshold, they're fairly low. They obviously increase for, for larger events if we just can consider magnitude 7 earthquakes. So now we're, we're getting much, more, uh, uh, much better signal-to-noise ratios. At, at this threshold of events, so, so for the events that, that are going to be particularly hazardous for um, uh, trans-Pacific um, earthquake hazards and tsunamis, um, our, our response capabilities um, improve fairly significantly. And again, for, for magnitude 8 events, um, we, we get much better um, usage of that data, but, but still identifying some stations um, that, that don't perform uh, very well at all. 
if we move on then to incorporate some of these statistics into our response capabilities, so now rather than using uh, just broad global statistics to modify that, that response capabilities map, I'm using uh, regionally specific statistics that look at the individual stations and how many times those actual stations can be used in an inversion. This map shows um, a, a better idea of, of our response capabilities um, given how many times we've used each of these seismic stations in inversions o o over the past uh, 10 or 15 years. And it, it, still you can see because of the, the, the uh, broad density of data in, in the uh, 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 western US and, and Alaska, very short response times, but um, increasing response times as we move further around the arc, and particularly in the, the Kural Kamchatka region, response times approaching uh, 15 minutes because signal to noise ratios tend to be, tend to be lower here, and station density is, is also lower. Obviously, uh, this, is, this is based on magnitude six statistics, so um, these, these times could potentially be improved for, for larger earthquakes, but nevertheless, this gives us an idea of, of, of what those response capabilities are. And this map just shows that, that the ratio of, of the last map I showed you to the one with global statistics to show that in general, stations in this region are, are, are performing um, not, not quite as well as, uh, as, as, as average global statistics. Um, because of the higher signal to noise ratios in this region. So, so to improve this map, to improve these response times, what we need to do is improve the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the stations that currently exist, not just throw more stations at this, that, although you know, as Alaska shows, that would be great. But, it, but if we can improve the uh, monitoring capabilities of, of those existing stations, then that, that, that will in turn improve our response times in, in these regions. I don't mean to, to paint a negative picture with that. Um, I, I think we've been improving things drastically over the past decade, and our response to the, the to Hoku earthquake uh, last year demonstrated that. The times that I'm speaking about, the response times to accurate magnitudes that I'm speaking about in, in those figures are under 20 minutes. In, in, in 2011, for the Tohoku earthquake, in, in, in 20 minutes, we'd just uh, received our first estimates of the, of the size of the uh, Tohoku earthquake using the teleseismic version of this W-phase technique. And over the, the, the course of that first hour, we uh, improved and released uh, to the public our estimates of, of that uh, earthquake size. All of this occurred well before any information had even been released about the occurrence of the Great Sumatra earthquake in 2004. So over the past decade, we've really been improving things and pushing our response times from what were hours in the past to under an hour and to hopefully uh, five tens, tens of minutes in, in the future. And, and over that same time scale, we're releasing estimates of the impact of these earthquakes um, immediately after information of those earthquakes are released, after any update to those magnitudes. Um, so within an hour of the Tohoku earthquake occurring, we had released uh, accurate information about the, the true impact of, of what we expected this event to be that didn't change over the course of that earthquake response over the coming days and weeks. And within a couple of hours, we had included into those estimates of population exposure and, and, and shaking intensity estimates of finiteness of the earthquake source uh, to really incorporate what we think um, that, that the size of that earthquake uh, will be. Um, just, just to, to, to finish up, touching on some uh, research efforts in the region, one of the things that we've been doing are building uh, slab geometry models uh, of, of these subduction zones using uh, catalogs of seismicity and uh, any uh, information from active source seismic data we can get. So these models um, image the, the three-dimensional geometry of these subduction zones, both in Alaska Aleutians and Kuril Kamchatka. And, and, and what we can do with some of these models, and I apologize that this figure is a little washed out, is um, analyze the, the moment release of those earthquakes and how that compares to historical earthquakes in the region. So this shows for the Kamchatka Kuril arc the, 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 the history of, of, of moment release in these great earthquakes over the past 40 years, how that compares to other great earthquakes in the 20th century, and we can start to use uh, these, these kinds of analyses to understand uh, where we might expect hazardous earthquakes to be in the future. This is the, the same kind of uh, viewpoint in, in the Alaska Aleutians arc, um, in, in, in the central Aleutians, and we can see that uh, west of the Amnio Fracture Zone, there's been some very large earthquakes in 86, 96, and 2003. East of the Amnio Fracture Zone, there hasn't been much at all. 
And what we want to do is compare these uh, estimates to um, GPS analyses that tell us what's locked and what's not to really understand uh, where, where hazards exist. Finally, there's also a lot of uh, paleo seismological studies going on in the region. Uh, this is some work that, that has been done by Alan Nelson, uh, Peter Hausler, uh, Rob Witter, Rich Briggs, and some others. And you can go to this poster to learn more about it. But basically, these studies uh, are, are trying to understand that the, the history of, of mega thrust earthquakes in this region, the history of tsunamis in this region, and what that means for uh, the, the hazards moving forward. Um, so so I'll, I'll leave that up to, uh, uh, to, to summarize. Uh, we're, we're pushing our, our response capabilities to even shorter times moving forward, um, but I still think there are, there are opportunities to improve things moving forward. Thanks very much. Yeah, that's very interesting, Gavin. So where, where will the next big ones be? Somewhere along that arc. Oh, good. <laughs> OK. Uh, our, next, our next speaker is S.S. Um, S. Gulick, Tectonic Origin of the 1899 Yakutat Bay Earthquakes, Alaska, and Insights into Future Hazards. No, no problem. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to talk about uh, now is a, uh, um, a National uh, Earthquake Hazard Reduction Program cruise that was funded this summer uh, to go look for uh, the origin of the largest co-seismic uplift event uh, that has uh, ever been recorded, um, which occurred in Yakutat Bay, Alaska. Um, there were basically two events within the space of a week. Uh, one was in uh, uh, near Icy Bay, um, on September 4th of 1899, roughly magnitude 8.1, which appears to be somewhat uh, somehow related to basically the subduction of the Yakutat terrain and oceanic plateau beneath North America. Um, and it's likely something related to a, a fairly standard megathrust event. Um, the more confusing one is there was a second event on September 10th, um, so six days later, that was probably an, an 8.2 or so that occurred somewhere in the vicinity of Yakutat, Disenchantment Bay, Russell Fjord up in here where we have the uh, Yakutat terrain sliding past North America along the Fairweather uh, Fault uh, and then wrapping around into this, uh, this collisional subduction zone. Um, so somewhere in this corner is where um, this, this event happened. Um, and it was felt, uh, this is a report by Tarr and Martin in 1912, who surveyed the area in 1905. Um, it was felt through a very large area in southeastern Alaska um, and even generated a standing wave down here in Lake Chelan, Washington. Um, so they were, they were fairly uh, significant events. But more impressive is actually the local effects. These are uh, images from Tarr and Martin, again taken uh, a few years after the event, uh, of wave cut platforms uplifted by several meters, a number of cases where the, the, the probably six meters tsunami actually took out a large section of, uh, of the coast. Uh, and the most impressive is this one here, which is Bonkis Point, uh, where based on uplifted barnacle lines, it was probably on the order of a 14 meters of co-seismic uplift. Um, and yet there is no clear uh, uh, faulting cutting through that area. However, this is an area that we would expect a lot of tectonic activity. These, uh, these colored bars are the thickness of the incoming Yakutat Oceanic Plateau. And you can see it's something like 17 kilometers in this area. But as you get towards the southeastern corner, it increases to over 30 kilometers. And so you have this sort of welt of thickened crust coming along the strike slip fault and entering into the subduction collision boundary. And so this area um, does make sense that you'd have a lot of tectonic activity. 
So we went out uh, to go look for uh, faults that had been proposed uh, by a recent uh, uh, paper by Plafker and Thatcher in 2008 that suggested there might be a lot of different faults that could cut across this area. There could be the Ultima Loy fault down here, the Yakutat fault that maybe cuts across the bay here, and possibly the reason for this focused uplift is a, a pair of faults, the Esker Creek and Bonkus Point fault, which may be in some way related to the subduction and collisional thrust further to the west. Um, and there's also some suggestion even of, of deformation over here in Russell Fjord where a, an offshoot of the Fairweather system called the Boundary Fault um, exists. Um, so here's a, a shot of the bathymetry data in this area, and we do actually have some pre-existing data. There's a, a line that cuts across Russell Fjord that we have that's a, that's a, a chirp line. Um, and I must apologize on my seismic lines. I forgot to put scale bars on any of them. So I'm going to do my best to just verbally tell you as we go through. So here's the first one. This is a chirp line. It's roughly eight kilometers across this way and about 20 meters deep. And we would argue that there is a tectonic fault at the base of this fjord, um, which is likely uh, the boundary fault. Um, the uh, next line that we had previous was a line that's kind of right down the middle of this channel that's carved by the Hubbard Glacier when it kind of migrates its way down here during glacial maxima. The Malaspina Glacier comes out and fills most of Yakutat Bay. So we have a line kind of running right down the middle of this. Here's some high-res bathymetry of that zone, and here's the, the 1700 retreat moraine and the 1265 retreat moraine, and our seismicon literally runs right down the center of this image. Here's that seismic line. Here's that thicker moraine, which is roughly uh, two and a half kilometers across this way. And what you observe is that there's a lot of, uh, of fairly flat-lying strata directly beneath uh, these materials. There's a little bit of velocity pull-up here, but no obvious evidence of a fault down the center of the bay. Here's a zoom-in of it. And again, you can see this largely flat-lying strata, except for, for that velocity pull-up. And uh, so at this point, there wasn't any obvious locations for a fault within the bay. So we went out this summer over the space of about 10 days and uh, using the Alaskan gyre and acquired all the lines here in purple. Um, what we did was to use our high resolution uh, seismic system. So basically we create our own air with this compressor and these tanks. We tow a 100 meter 24 channel streamer. There's the tail buoy off in the distance. Uh, we tow a, a mini GI gun, a 1515 cubic inch GI gun with its own little GPS on its buoy. Um, hanging down here, and uh, as a backup, we had a little chirp system. And here's a picture from out the back of the, the USGS vessel collecting the data to laptops and, and observing the experiment as we went. Now, this is challenging in, in this area because there's a lot of ice, and so we actually got to be ice jousters and push the ice away from the, uh, the equipment as it came by, and that actually mostly worked. Occasionally, it didn't. Um, and here's some of the data that we collected. Um, so this is uh, line 1202, which crosses right here. And if the Yakutat fault was an actual fault, and I, I note that there's actually no mapping of this fault, just a suggestion based on uplifts, um, then we should see it cutting through about in these sediments here. And this is about 200 meters of sediments this way. That feature there is about uh, two and a half kilometers wide. Um, and what we observe in this area is no obvious evidence of any kind of faulting cutting through these glacial moraines or this, uh, this retreated, uh, retreat sediment uh, within that glacial valley. Um, show you some more data. Here's line 1206, which is now here. Should cross both the Ultima Loy Fault and the Akatat Fault. Um, and again, uh, what we observe here is a, a 300 meter deep or so, uh, about an eight kilometer wide uh, glacial U-shaped valley, and we don't observe any active thrusting um, or any active, say, strike slip faults anywhere within the, the moraines on the southern part. Um, the one thing we do observe is this little dipping reflector here, which possibly might be a fault. Um, it's not clear. However, none of the sediments above, and this is roughly uh, 100 meters or so, of, uh, sorry, uh, about 50 meters of sediments above, um, none of this is, uh, appears to be offset, and therefore um, that's probably not the player for an 1899 event. Um, here's a, a shot of uh, some chirp data up that same slope, and this penetrates about only about 10 meters or so, uh, but you can see that we don't see any evidence in the shallow near surface of any deformation. Uh, here's another line, 1213, again, would cross the Ultima Loy Fault. Uh, again, we don't see any evidence of, of deformation here. Here's about a 300 meter deep U-shaped valley. Another line here now crossing right about where the Yakutat Fault should take a corner and come off if it was present. And again, we don't see any obvious uh, evidence of deformation within the uh, nice flat-lying sediments in the center of the bay. 
If we uh, look at one little chirp line up here in the corner, right up near where uh, the boundary fault cuts over to the Hubbard Glacier, we do see some thinning. This is con conceivably some growth strata in here, but it's also conceivably some kind of downslope process. So this is uh, not certain whether that, that can be uh, attributed to tectonics or not. Um, here's a line basically right off of uh, Bonkis Point. Um, directly um, kind of parallel to Bonkis Point, and again, we don't see any uh, deformation uh, within these sediments. Um, here's a line that basically crosses the bay, um, effectively right again where the Akatat Fault should cut through. Um, and once again, you know, this is something on the order of 10 kilometers across here, and we again don't see any evidence uh, for any uh, clear faulting uh, within this area or along this slope, which is a sort of a gravelly beach uh, that comes down from where some of the glacial outwash occurs uh, in this area. And there's some very steep slopes in the sides of this fjord, so it's conceivable it could be hiding from us along these, uh, these rather steep uh, embankments. Um, and here's the last line I'll show you. This is kind of, again, cutting across approximately where the Yakutat or the Ultimaloi faults might cut through. Uh, and again, we see the Akitat moraines on this side. We see the deposition from the Hubbard Glacier and lots of flat-lying uh, material. Um, I don't think that's structural. I think that's a glacial moraine from a previous event, and there's a nice flat-lying reflector right above it uh, from sediments. So again, I don't think we're seeing any active tectonic deformation on this line either. So where does that take us? Um, well, here are the many faults that have been suggested in the past. Um, we certainly don't see um, either the Boncas Point or Esker Creek making it out into the bay, but it is conceivable, of course, that these are right at the beach, or in fact that there are blind thrusts underneath where that 14 meters of uplift occurred. We certainly do see the active boundary fault within the Russell Fjord, and you can even see it in the hills here. Um, these faults have not been mapped on shore. They've been suggested based on, on subsidence and uplift records uh, along, but we do not actually see any evidence on any of the seismic lines that cross either of these two faults, unfortunately, um, nor anything that would cross across the bay here. So that leaves us with a conundrum. We have the highest co-seismic uplift in the world. Um, we definitely have uplift of the beach on the east side of this and on the west side. Here's the highest one right here. Um, so we could argue for a blind thrust here that is part of the collisional system, um, and that would be fine. That makes sense. But how do you explain all of the uplifts on this side of the bay um, without some additional structures? And this is where we're, we're scratching our heads. We're not sure at this point at all. Um, but what we plan to do is attempt to uh, see about getting some more LIDAR acquired in the area uh, in collaboration with our colleague Peter Heusler. Um, and uh, to see about integrating this with any other data we can get a hold of, satellite photos, um, uh, more bathymetry data that, that may potentially be available, and see if potentially there is uh, maybe more branches to the boundary fault within here that are transpressional that might explain this side of the, the, the event, um, and see if we can get any additional information about whether maybe there's uh, some collisional faulting on this side to explain this side of the bay. But, what we would have to say is there isn't any uh, way to tie structures across the wet spots uh, where we've done all of our work. Um, implications for this from a, a larger picture is that um, these complicated tectonic zones are often sort of underappreciated. We spend a lot of time thinking about the very large uh, strike-slip faults that can have long rupture zones. We spend a lot of time thinking about the, the big mega thrust, and I do a lot of my work on that. And those are, those are really important places to study. But this is a place where if this is a single event, and that's the, all the indications are that it was a single event, then we have actually two different systems and a, and a seismic event that actually jump between the systems co-seismically and therefore added to the risk and added to the hazard, and maybe that's something we need to be thinking about in terms of fault inter interactions. And I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, question for Sean? Well then, what is, uh, thank you very much, yep. it's in very interesting. And uh, move on to uh, tsunamis, or paleo tsunamis. Jody Bourgeois from uh, University of Washington. Um, <clears throat> Geologic records of Pacific Rim geohazards in the Russian Far East focus on paleo tsunamis. Jody. Where, so. It's that one. Forward? How, do you, oh, how does it go no, forward? This one. Yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> this okay. one going forward. That one going forward. Okay, thank you. 
Thank you very much. Um, and thank you to Marsha McNutt for mentioning the geologic record as an important part of, um, of evaluating geohazards. So most of the talks you've heard so far have been um, about real time. Um, Sean got back about 100 years. Um, so I'm going to take you back some thousands of years. And the, um, the importance of paleoseismology um, has, is best illustrated by the Tohoku event that happened in 2011. But I'd also like to point out that um, Cascadia is actually in the North Pacific, and it's not part of this session, but it's at about the same latitude as the central Kurils, and so it really does belong um, and is another example where geologic evaluations have been important. So we're asking what is the long-term probability of geohazards, and if you're building something like a nuclear power plant, this is obviously a question that you want to ask, not just what happens every year, but what happens on a 500 to millennial time scale. So in particular, in the North Pacific, there isn't very much historical record, so we're looking at evidence for events that are larger than those known historically in these areas that do have short historical records and few scattered observations, and asking both what are the local effects, but also what are the long distance effects. Now we have a couple of uh, recent poster children uh, for these kinds of events. You've already seen some of you um, examples from the Sarachev eruption, which did interrupt air traffic in the North Pacific. And here's the 2006 central Kuril tsunami, which did damage in Crescent City, California. So and these are relatively small events. Oops. The other way. So we want to ask what's the frequency and magnitude of these events, and in particular, you know, look at the larger scale events that may have happened but don't happen very often. So I'm focusing on the Kuril Kamchatka uh, region, and these are the historic the histor historical record goes back to about 1737, and the largest event was the 1952 magnitude nine event, and you can see that that it is an active seismic zone. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, Holocene volcanic activity as well. These are the historically active uh, volcanoes and Kamchatka Kurils, and these are the two largest historical events, Besamiani and Stubelkohn. Of course, if we go to the Holocene, it's kind of a blur, but this is the, the global catalog, and you can see that this is obviously a very active volcanic arc. So when we want to extend the historical record, we obviously are looking at the geological evidence, and it's obvious for volcanic eruptions, you can find evidence like lava and volcanic ash deposits. Um, but you can see landslides are involved in many of these events, and they also generate tsunamis. So I'm basically a tsunami sedimentologist, and I'll be talking a little bit about those and how we use them in order to reconstruct the past. So I'm looking in particular at tsunamis as proxies for earthquakes and looking at both kinds of events that have happened um, along the Kirill Kamchatka Trench. And these are different field sites. Um, most of them I've been to. There are a few in southern Japan, uh, excuse me, in northern Japan um, and other people's data that we are including in our analysis. We use historical cases like the 2006-2007 Central Kuril's Pair in order to understand something about the geological record. For example, in this profile in the Central Kuril's, here's the 2006 tsunami deposit in blue, and you can see older events that were more extensive than the 2006 tsunami deposit. Now, we're very lucky in this region um, in terms of the volcanic activity in that it gives us excellent age control. And I've been lucky to um, collaborate with Vera Ponomaryova and others in order to use these tephra. And also, I think we've contributed something to mapping the tephra and understanding the longer term history of volcanic eruptions, um, in particular in Kamchatka and some in the Kuril Islands. So these are the largest events that have happened, and um, all of them are you know, at least two times larger than the historic events, and some of them are orders of magnitude larger, such as the Kuril Lake eruption um, about 7,000 years ago. Um, the, the record is actually um, has a pause period in the middle Holocene, so it's convenient for putting the title there. Um, but you can see the, you know, basically the record of the largest eruptions in Kamchatka and the Kurils 
Um, but this is actually a very complete, ca excuse me, it's an incomplete catalog, although it's more complete than many catalogs of other volcanic arcs in the world. Well, in our excavations, um, we're looking for tsunami deposits and using ash layers as time control, but we do find records, for example, of a volcanic ash here that's from Xudach II, and it wasn't previously known from that area. So basically it doubled the area of the isopax for the Xudach II eruption. And recently we've been working in this area and mapped the Pulaski tephra um, from about 10,000 years ago, and which was found recently on a German cruise in Kors offshore. So this makes, um, it's one of the largest Holocene eruptions from Kamchatka, and it previously was basically unknown. So just those two events add new volumes um, to this diagram, and there are, pro there are certainly many more other events um, that haven't been completely mapped and studied. And those include the Kuril's caldera eruptions, which here are just estimated all at um, five to 10 kilometers cubed in volume because they haven't been mapped yet as completely. Oops. So um, it was mentioned earlier, one of the most active volcanoes um, on Kamchatka is Shevelich. It has been active throughout the Holocene. And before the, these same cores were taken offshore, it was believed that sort of the maximum extent of ash from the Shevelich eruption was out here just sort of toward the edge of Bering Island. And so the, also the area that's been affected by Shevelich ashes and you know, the sizes of those eruptions are also increasing. So I'll use that to go to my poster child slide for tsunami deposits. Um, and this is from northern Kamchatka, and it shows the 1964 Shevelich volcanic ash, which was about one kilometer cubed eruption. And then the um, 1650 Shevelich eruption, which is not historical, so the date is approximate. And then one of the largest marked tephras on the coast of Kamchatka, the Sudetch ash. And so what we do is, obviously, we're describing and mapping the tsunami deposits in between these ashes and using them for our age control. So that particular excavation came from a series of 10 excavations across a single profile here from northern Kamchatka. And basically, you can see the extent of a um, historic tsunami, which we now interpret to be the 1971 tsunami, and then previous events, some of which were more extensive. And so we can use these excavations to do statistics and sort of look at the problem or look at the recurrence intervals for tsunamis. So this is a published diagram, but it just shows you using the marker tephra as age control, that is the yellow lines, we can count the number of tsunami deposits in between those lines, and from that we can develop um, frequency curves or recurrence intervals. In this case, they're shown in number of tsunami deposits per thousand years for a number of localities on Kamchatka and a couple um, in the central Kuril Islands for more recent work. And in all of these cases, the tsunamis had low, run up of more than five meters, so these are not small events. These are all large events. Well, I've shown most of these slides other times, so I decided today I want to show something new, um, analysis from southern Kamchatka. And of course, southern Kamchatka is the region that was affected by the magnitude 9, um, 1952 um, earthquake and tsunami. So I'm going to take you to Vesnik Bay, and this is a um, fabulous set of beach ridges um, in the bay, and it also includes a river ro um, outcrop through the... Um, Holocene stratigraphy. So we see, um, and it also has very active volcanoes in the neighborhood. So I'll show you an example of Vesnik profile 12 and use the, the outcrop here to help make an interpretation. So um, we commonly show our profiles with great vertical exaggeration. Um, this is the Vesnik profile 12, and there's the Inconouche outcrop. And I just point out that this is the profile with two times vertical exaggeration. If I made it no vertical exaggeration, you wouldn't see it. But you have to realize that this is not really mountainous terrain. Um, but the maximum elevation is about 12 meters. 
So we have both the outcrop stratigraphy as well as the excavations that we made in order to look at the statistics for the tsunami deposits. In this case, the tsunami deposits are in green and the tephra are very multicolored. Um, in this particular example. I've just shown you the excavations more distal from the sea, that is the ones from 800 meters inland, because in this case, the tsunamis are large enough, like the 1952, that the record here is very sandy, and you can't, and you can't really count individual uh, tsunamis. So based on the deposit here, there is no historic record of 1952, but the deposit got to about a kilometer inland from the 1952 magnitude Kipchaka tsunami. Now, if we look at this record, you can see that there are four more events above a thousand-year-old tephra that are on the same, you know, the same scale or order of magnitude size or greater than the 1952 tsunami. We actually, because there's been some building out of the coastline, we, we add 250 meters in order to look at comparable scale. Um, there are two of those were, were definitely larger than 1952 at this particular locality. Now, if we go and look at the older record, we have to be careful because the coastline itself and its geomorphology has changed through time. So, for example, you can see many tsunami deposits here between about 3,500 and 4,800 years old, and they're very far from the coastline. But they weren't very far from the coastline when this event happened. And for that, we can use this outcrop stratigraphy, and I'll just take you through kind of uh, how we build that stratigraphy. And you can see that the coastline basically moved through time. And so when you reconstruct the past, like events back here, you have to reconstruct also the locality of the coastline. Well, I'm hoping the next talk will tell you something about how you might use numbers like this in order to do complete hazard analyses um, including events that may happen on a time scale of maybe every 500 or 1,000 years. Remember that when you see it, big numbers down here, you have to do the coastal reconstruction as well. So there are some field data gaps, um, but we've got it pretty well covered, I think, compared to the Aleutians. So we're hoping to see the same kind of approach and study um, along the Aleutian um, Alaska arc. Um, I'll point out that one of those data gaps is Bering Island, um, and so this definitely requires um, joint Russian-American cooperation to study this region, which has some similarities to the um, northern Sumatra zone that ruptured in 2004. So again, to extend the historical record, um, we use geological evidence. Many places in the world have historical records that are only a few centuries, and yet uh, many of these very large events happen on time scales of 500 years to, say, a millennium. And so, you know, we're asking what are these long-term probabilities of geohazards and um, trying to answer these kinds of questions. Some of the challenges that remain are integrating different teams' data because we have different approaches. Um, in particular, statistical treatment of the data, that is when the coastline changes or you're trying to you know, say how big one tsunami was compared to another. And then, of course, um, we still have some data gaps in the Russian Far East and the Aleutians as well. Um, soon, as I like to say, volcanic ash and tsunamis don't stay home. And so what happens in the Aleutians and the Kirill Kamchatka arc um, definitely have an impact on us as well in the US. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Jody. That's uh, an impressive effort and a lot of digging. Any questions? Uh, the hour grows late, but uh, don't run off. We still have the queen of disaster scenarios, Lucy Jones, with a, backed by a cast of thousands. <laughs> Thank you, John. <laughs> um, let's see. Yeah, I saw the uh, okay. one. Right. Oh, okay. Very good. Yep. All right. Yeah. Um, welcome to the, the bitter few and the bitter end. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm going to give an overview of the, uh, our most recent disaster scenario that we're undertaking with the USGS, which is the, what we're calling the next wave tsunami scenario. Um, 
This has been uh, part of a series being done um, by the USGS and through our Natural Hazards Mission Area. Uh, as part of our, nat our science planning process, we have highlighted the need of getting our science used, that we are doing hazard science for the purpose of, of uh, uh, protecting the security, safety, and economic well-being of the nation. That means we need to get our science used if it's going to be making a difference. And one approach to doing this is through our scenario process. Uh, we started this in uh, Southern California with the multi-hazards demonstration project. Uh, and in that process, uh, our partners asked for a scenario of a San Andreas earthquake. And when we went through that process, we started discovering how valuable the science can be, as well as the effort to get the uh, users to use our data. Um, we also then went on and did a storm scenario. You've probably been hearing some about the atmospheric rivers coming into California. It's been sort of interesting. I've heard several talks today about, uh, from the arc storm scenario. The science is continuing as we look at how these various storms, the very largest storms, can be affecting landsliding and other processes. We've now uh, moved on to a tsunami scenario. And we are still doing this focused on California, but we're looking at a teleseismic tsunami coming into California, and that means we actually need to be bringing it out from the North Pacific. Let me take a moment to talk about the scenario process. I'm giving the example here uh, for the tsunami scenario, but it's very important in this to make to, to span a wide range of sciences, because if you're actually trying to look at the implication of the science for the community, you can't use just one field alone. And nat all of our natural disasters are very complicated processes. We need to start from a base of really solid earth science, but that alone doesn't tell people what's going to be happening to them. We need to work with the engineering community to understand the implications of the hazard for an, a region. But even beyond that, if you really want to look at what matters to people, it's often not the straight engineering results, but we need to in involve the social sciences to look at what the economic impacts can be, how the emergency response is handled, what's the social impact uh, to a region from the various disasters going through. And unlike earthquakes, where the earthquake happens and you deal with it, uh, with both uh, the storms and the tsunamis, the forecasting and warning process becomes part of uh, the results and the disasters that can happen, because how people respond to the warnings uh, strongly affects what the, the total outcomes are going to be. So it, it leads to a more complicated feedback process when you're trying to understand what's going on. Um, our principles and how we've gone about this and what are the ones worth doing. First, we need to have a disaster large enough to be bother, bothering to do the process. If you're talking about a level of event that people in emergency management have dealt with. You know, in California, if we're talking about the Northridge earthquake, people already know how to handle that. We move on and really talk about the big San Andreas earthquakes that we haven't seen in 100 years. In the tsunami process, we're trying to understand what's the worst plausible tsunami. And that's a point, is that it's got to be plausible. We aren't trying to go for the extreme event that maybe is going to come once every 1,000 years. I mean, we. We could have gone and looked at the flank failure of the Hawaiian volcano and, and had a tsunami that happens once every 25,000 years. It's wor the worst one that probably can come into Los Angeles, but it's probably not an appropriate basis for planning. But the other uh, pieces of this that are really important is that we can't do this alone, that as we look at what the implications and the impact of the disaster are, we really do need to be engaging with our community partners because they're the ones that we want to get to use it they're also the ones who often know what their systems are really like. And if we come from the outside and say, oh, I know what the disaster is going to be on your, uh, you know, the impact is going to be on your infrastructure, they're not going to buy it. They need to be part of the process, and that also helps them take ownership of the results and move to do something about it. So if we look at what's going on on the next wave tsunami scenario, we've been working on it for a while. Um, just as we were starting to finalize what our source was going to be, that's the Tohoku earthquake happened, and our geologists backed off and were not willing to say that they were really looking at the right event again. So we did a big reanalysis with that. Uh, 
as we're going through the process, we're working strongly with the, closely with the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach because um, the impact on ports is one of some of the biggest financial impacts that happen from any of the tsunamis. But we are looking at it for all of California and have the option of taking it beyond these regions and want to work with other areas. But we did pick an event that was the worst for California, which uh, means it's not the worst for a lot of other regions. And as part of this partnership with the ports, we're going to be releasing the results at the International Port Conference that will be hosted by the Port of Los Angeles in May of next year. Um, also, one of the other pieces that we've done with this and that we've done with previous ones of our scenarios is partner with the art community. I don't know how many of you uh, heard some of the earlier talks today on science communication and working with artists as a way of compelling the community to look at it. All of our public events, our public um, information campaigns have been developed with the Art Center College of Design and we've engaged with one of their advertising classes. Uh, we're going to get the results next week on how to do compelling uh, but appropriate uh, social messaging about tsunami awareness in the beach communities of California, uh, as I said, being done with the artists. But it's to do this, uh, we needed to turn to the Alaska Peninsula. and this. Uh, uh, plot shows you basically why. If you look at all of the tsunami hazard that can come into the Los Angeles area, this is a disaggregation plot showing you where the maximum impact is expected to be and are expected to be coming from. And uh, the Aleutian Peninsula is the uh, one that has the biggest impact in the Los Angeles area. Part of this is because the orientation of the trench is focused towards the southeast, but then also that it's the, there are, you know, a, Japan is also focused towards uh, the California coastline, but being farther away, it doesn't produce as big a result. So we explored a wide range of possible sources in the uh, Aleutian Arc and what the impact would be in Southern California. The bottom line actually is it's really difficult to get a decent sized tsunami into Los Angeles. Uh, as scientists, we are a bit disappointed. As residents of the United States, we're probably pretty happy about this as these are the largest ports coming into the United States. What we ended up using is a put, we put the Tohoku earthquake into the Alaskan Peninsula. Uh, this is a result from the uh, Tsunami Source Working Group that's headquartered out of the USGS in Menlo Park. Um, they felt that there were compelling geologic reasons that uh, similarities between this area and northern Japan that made it plausible to look at the similar type of, of tsunami being generated out of the Aleutian Arc. Right. This event is close to the maximum that can be received in Southern California, uh, the, the largest tele-tsunami. It is not the largest in uh, areas farther to the north. One important factor is that uh, the size of the event, it, nowhere does the maximum inundation exceed the county tsunami inundation, inundation zones already in place from the uh, National Tsunami Hazard Mitigation Program. So uh, it completely fits with all what's already in place as being the, the tsunami risk. And in fact, you know, it's less than that in many of the regions. But of course, that's going to be true of any one tsunami since the maximum zones are the maximum possible at any one place. Right. Uh, an important part of what we do, as I said, we work with the community to get the estimate of what the losses are going to be. In all case, we have a series of panels. In the case of the tsunami, we worked with some of their major uh, engineering partners. Moffat and Nichols is a firm that's done a lot of work already with the port. To, and they did an analysis of what they thought the damages would be. And then we've had a series of panels with the port management, the engineers, and the emergency management for the ports to really go through what the results are and talk through piece by piece. Same thing with Caltrans. We want to look at the distribution, the uh, di um, damage uh, to the transportation systems along the coast. We sat down with the Caltrans engineers, looked at where the inundation would be, look at the patterns of where their bridges are to come up with an estimate of what the losses are. And again, we also then have a series of community meetings going on with different communities down the coast to look at what the inundation patterns are, to look at what the currents are. And that's actually a big piece that's come out of this is that especially in Southern California where the inundation levels are not that high, the primary damage to the ports is actually coming from currents within the port. So we have a group from USC including Pat Lynette who's actually doing physical modeling of the currents to be seen within the ports and understanding what aspects of the ports 
are uh, contributing to these, these high levels of currents at various uh, places within it uh, that are actually now going to be the last meeting we had with the ports, they are looking at being able to use uh, that information as they're putting in some new um, terminals and how to structure the actual channels to reduce the uh, impacts of some of the, um, the high currents. This is an incredibly important part in, in what we have uh, uh, done over the, the various years as the uh, its shakeout. We, found that by having engaged the Southern California Edison, for instance, in the discussion of what the losses were, they then turned around and spent $20 million of their own money to really understand the impact of San Andreas earthquakes on their grid and to start making some improvements. So we think that this process is the most important one to getting a commitment to using the results, and we're already starting to see this with the ports. I keep on emphasizing the ports just because of what they're, the uh, very large financial uh, status of the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach to the nation. Uh, we have over 70 percent of the um, uh, container traffic into the United States coming in through the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach, over 40 percent of the total imports to the United States. So if we have damage to the ports, we're seeing an impact that will be traveling uh, around the country. Uh, and here's uh, just one graph of this, the level of uh, truck, tra truck and train transportation out of the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach to the rest of the country. So if we do damage to those ports, we are affecting the whole nation. Right. Um, some of the type of results that we are producing and getting ready for this, we, we do this, uh, we're doing detailed currents for the several different ports. We are doing sample merograms for the whole coast. Uh, this is one example of them. Part of this is the education for people to understand that a tsunami is not just one wave coming in. It goes on for a long time, which actually contributed to the choice of the next wave as the, the name for the scenario and the education campaign that's going to come with it. Um, one of the other uh, types of example, this is uh, work being done by Nate Wood on geographic analysis of um, uh, who is impacted by this, uh, by this tsunami, one of the things that we see is that uh, we would probably be evacuating about 250,000 people because this would be a maximum warning. Everybody in a maximum tsunami inundation zone would be evacuated. Actually, only about one-third of those people would actually be getting wet. And we're seeing as we do this analysis that it could be that the evacuation itself will be the, one of the largest sources of losses. So it's emphasizing that the ability to do a rapid modeling of what the tsunami is likely to be like, where we might be able to modify some of those maximum tsunami inundation zones, could be a very important factor in reducing the cost that the tsunami would have for our region. And let me just end by saying, if you're interested in more details, uh, Wednesday afternoon there's a lot of there's, uh, advances in tsunami hazard mitigation posters, details by many of the different coordinators. This is a team of about uh, 20 uh, scientists that have been part of our actual coordination team spanning from the earth sciences to the, uh, the modeling to the engineering and, and then into emergency management, environmental uh, losses and social vulnerability and economic analysis. And all of those details are being provided in the poster section. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, great. Well, uh, any questions for Lucy? Yes. We actually have done a specific analysis for both Diablo Canyon and San Onofre. Uh, they, neither of them are at risk from this tele-tsunami, which is, and they are in the areas where this is uh, the maximum tele-tsunami that would be available. We haven't analyzed how they would respond to the very rare local tsunami might be generated by a landslide, but uh, both of them are at high enough elevation that there would really be no impact on them. Yeah, it is. Overall, uh, it might be a little disappointing for the scientists doing the analysis, but in general, we're sort of surprised at how low the losses are. Okay, good. Thanks. Yeah. No <laughs> doom and gloom there. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, all who listened and participated. And uh, 
Again, there will be a town hall on Wednesday at 12.30 if you're interested in talking about uh, Russia-U.S. collaborative projects. Thanks again.